four years now, uh, second engineer, so seen our growth as it went up, uh, as like a hockey stick. So it's been a pretty interesting journey. Uh, so what we're doing here today is is, is sharing a, a bit of that journey with you and, and see how how we came to the spot we are in here, especially on the, on the data side. Uh, and for those of you who aren't aware of this, but a little bit about Dollar Shave Club is that we started out as a men's grooming company, uh, or sorry, a research subscription company. And then since then we've gone into, a, into a really owning the men's bathroom. So we've since launched hair care products and, and, and shaving products and skin care and, and Healthcare. So we're really trying to go for you know, anything that men need to use uh, for grooming. We want to be there. And as part of this, we believe that technology is going to enrich that experience and also help take us there. Um, a little bit about the, the, the engineering uh, situation at Dollar Shave Club. Uh, way back in the day, we were yeah, I, I believe it was a it was a, a site that was contracted out, built on Drupal. Uh, there was no engineering team; it was just Mike, our CEO, in his, in his garage trying to build the site. Uh, since then, we've uh, we moved to Magento for a little while. Then uh, we moved to our custom uh, e-commerce platform that we built. What we found out was there was it was not really at least back in the day there was not really a platform that enables subscription e-commerce. Uh, so we built it from the ground up just for our specific use case. And over the years, out of need, we've had to build our own marketing automation platform, we had to build a subscription billing platform, uh, our fulfillment software, uh, and most recently it's our, well, and of course our infrastructure, and then we moved to a, a single page app, and, and with that, all of that, building all of that brings a lot of testing efforts, and. Uh, you know, we're big on test automation, and all of that sets the stage for, for us to start investing on the data side. So in 2015 is when we really started investing in our own in-house uh, data capabilities. Still then, our main source of data was, was Google Analytics, and, and we were trying to make do with what we had. We tried out mix panel for a little while. But in 2015 is when we started building our own data warehouse uh, in Redshift, and, and then Brett joined us and he's really taken us to the next level. Um, and so what you're going to be hearing today is how since 2015 we've, we've upped our game. We've since started exploring Spark. So Brett's going to go into a lot of detail there. He's our data lead. Uh, so please say hi to Brett. If you want to just come over here and just, uh, just uh, fill up the seats on the left hand side. Uh, also, one quick thing uh, how many days remember the LA holiday party from last year? How many days attended? It? So, we're going to do it again this year, uh, December. It's just a networking event, you know, future come out and hang, you know, meet your peers, you know, talk to others. So, we're going to do it again this year. I'll send out more information about that. Uh, with that, you know, uh, let's give a warm round of applause for Brian who's going to speak about tonight. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Jason. Uh, so uh, this is a great crowd. I was expecting to be one of the side speakers uh, suggested that we we host tonight here. So that's uh, part of the fact why we're using this space with this monitor. So uh, but, um, we're sort of living to our own success there. Um, uh, so I'm really glad you all made it tonight. Um, once again, I'm Brett Meters, uh, data lead at Dollar Shave Club. Um, and <clears throat> some background on the talk, an outline of the talk. I uh, just want to give some background on Dollar Shave Club, uh, some background on the engineering at Dollar uh, Shave, uh, some groundwork or the growth of the data team. Um, and then most of the presentation is going to be some show and tell uh, for a machine learning pipeline that really launched our efforts uh, in data science at Dollar Shave Club. Uh, <clears throat> but as an introduction, uh, I want to properly frame the talk. Um, and I think you should think about the talk as a kind of David and Goliath story. Um, it's definitely not, for example, 
trying to follow the model of an industry leader um, making a behind the scenes presentation of how the magic happens, right? Um, and I'm certainly not trying to be the first one to tell you about a brand new discovery or cutting edge technology. In fact, I'm sure many of you in the audience heard about Spark before I did. So, um, but instead, uh, this talk is about um, a David and Goliath story. What the sometimes surprising things that people can do with what's available to them. So, uh, which I think is very fitting for Dollar Shave Club. Um, so, uh, my favorite personally narrative about Dollar Shave Club is of this company that came out of nowhere and uh, took a big bite out of the consumer packaged goods market, a market that uh, communism still is, is dominated by giants that are almost uh, municipal. Okay. Uh, so Wall Street Journal picked up on that scenario when DSC was just getting started uh, back in 2012, and uh, we sort of bore that out. Uh, as you can see, the, the names have been changed here to protect the cranky and litigious. So, um, but uh, as a little background for Dollar Shave, uh, as Jason mentioned, our main offering is a razor cartridge subscription, which is shipped directly to customers monthly. Um, our customers join and manage their, uh, their subscriptions on a beautiful single page web app, which is masterfully designed by a front end team using Ember.js. Uh, and while they're on the site, they can shop our other offerings. There's two brands here, but we've now got, I believe, five distinct brands with dozens of, of products individually that they can choose from. <clears throat> or they can enjoy some of the original content, uh, which is going to be which is produced by by Dallas Shape Club, articles and, and videos that are created for people that enjoy our distinctive brand. So we actually, in general make a lot of effort to engage people in various online channels, uh, like Twitter. And our members can be very enthusiastic about joining the conversation. We get a lot of very diehard fans. Uh, but uh, so, so that's some background about the company. As a little uh, context about engineering, uh, Jason gave a uh, very more backstory. Uh, but uh, Dollar Shape Club really does invest in technology and thinks of it as a key differentiator, uh, an area where we continue to make serious investments. So, um, as an indication of that investment, engineering has grown from 11 engineers in 2014 to 48 engineers currently. Um, and we are organized by the four teams by areas of responsibility front end, back end, QA, and IT. Um, so, if you want a much more detailed description of our infrastructure, and architecture and, and culture. Uh, there's a great blog post that uh, Jason made on uh, highscalability.com recently. So you definitely check that out. <clears throat> okay, so uh, data engineering as a specialization in particular has developed organically uh, within the engineering team at Dollar Shave Club. Very much the way that Jason mentioned. Uh, uh, it's been driven directly by our goals and aspirations as a technology team. And we bootstrapped it with available resources uh, as needed with the people that are around. Right? Um, so, uh, since big data is supposed to be the giant of the story, let's talk for a moment about the barriers to entry that uh, there might be for a small and medium web company. Uh, so, so, certainly, big data requires a different set of capabilities. <coughs> There's very different technology stacks, of course, right? Um, which can be a barrier for a web development shop. Um, there are different programming models, functional, like MapReduce, um, which can be very different from our object-oriented models that we're familiar with. Um, and if machine learning or statistical analysis is the angle, then developers will often need to be familiar with those domains, um, since a certain amount of implementation of those uh, in those domains will often be required. And on the flip side, uh, if an analyst, um, if an analyst wants to get involved, uh, they do also need to be familiar with, with some uh, 
uh, uh, programming skills, right, so that they can get involved with the organization. So uh, another reason it can be uh, hard to get into is it's difficult to make investments uh, in future capabilities where a return on investment is not immediately there, right? We're not guaranteed um, to that our data mining or exploration efforts are going to succeed, right? Low hanging fruit is, is going to be already picked much easier than using some other uh, uh, means, right? Uh, and uh, the right feature extraction that's essential for data mining is going to take a lot of experimentation and uh, the help from doing experts. So, so all of those are investments that may not bear fruit. So really, having to develop a whole set of capabilities, not knowing exactly where it's going to pay off, it's hard to know where to start. That's the real question here, where do you start? Um, so fortunately, uh, engineering here at Dollar Shave Club has invested early on on a, in a really modern uh, infrastructure, um, trusting that it would be an asset later on. We're currently we're hosted 100% on AWS. Um, this diagram shows a little bit of the, the information flow between our various components. Um, so for example, we, we get uh, metrics and events, web analytics uh, from our web clients, our mobile clients, from our application there. Uh, through Snowplow, which is an open source project. Uh, we currently use the JavaScript tracker with the closure collector hosted on Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, we do the ETL crop enrichment process on EMR in AWS, uh, and we sync all of the data into Redshift. Um, so some of the, the really interesting stuff that we get from Snowplow, um, as a really immersive single page app, we get uh, a data about uh, every page view. Uh, we get link click events. We uh, can turn on page pings, which will pull for activity on the site, scroll a vertical and horizontal scroll. Um, we can uh, we set up various custom structured events, and uh, we can also make unstructured events of the uh, XHR requests that our client makes back then. Um, so other notable features, uh, we, we use fly data as a third party service to, uh, from our primary uh, database, RDS, MySQL, uh, to replicate into Amazon Redshift. So we use Redshift as a, a central data warehouse where uh, all sorts of analysis and, uh, can, can take place and animate them. Um, and you'll notice that the most recent addition in this whole chart is Databricks. Uh, how many of you have heard of Databricks? They, they are one of the, um, the gold standard, perhaps. I'll, I'll call them the gold standard uh, for hosted uh, Apache Spark um, out there. And uh, we've had a wonderful experience with them. We use, uh, they deploy right in AWS, uh, our private BBC, uh, and uh, they've been excellent about uh, service requests and, and uh, helping us grow our use of, of uh, Spark. So um, for those of you that don't know uh, much about AWS, uh, it offered, it's, a, it's a service, a deployment in AWS, um, which offers uh, automatic uh, push button Spark cluster management. Um, it also offers job scheduling and Apache Zeppelin style notebooks as an interface, an interactive interface with, with your Spark clusters. Um, on top of a whole bunch of organizational features, which they've added and we are currently taking advantage of, um, including uh, version control in which you can um, So it's really this simple addition that supported a whole set of new capabilities for us, and uh, we're far from reaching the limits that this allows us to accomplish. Um, so we, we currently have uh, multiple iterations on a machine learning pipeline, which is configurable for a variety of, uh, of data mining and, and uh, machine modelability tasks. Um, we are serving models in production. Uh, we are doing various exploratory analysis. In fact, that's, that's probably where the most exciting use of Spark is right now. Uh, we've done some uh, customer segmentation, um, hypothesis testing, going back and forth with different business interests. Um, 
on uh, you know, their hypotheses and whether they bear out in, in large data sets. Um, we're doing data mining uh, to try to find predictive features of various applications. And we've done some NLP, specifically topic modeling, uh, for our uh, member services, our customer service business. Okay. For the NLP, what do you like? What, 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 what are you trying to find out? You, you listen to their Twitter feed and find out what they're talking about? The topic model? The topic model? So, uh, this is much more of a, uh, our early attempts uh, have been to try to validate the uh, categorizations. So, we have a, a ticket system through um, Zendesk. Uh, and we're, they have a hand labeled um, tickets. Right? And so they've been trying to validate that system because they've gone through several iterations and they're looking for feedback on the effectiveness of that labeling system, which is a very good application for, uh, for, for, for data mining, for unsupervised learning, right? How, what does the data tell us is the best division, right? The best categorization. Yes? So, um, you know, we've tried to validate uh, hypotheses regarding engagement, where we've got a, a, a lot of theory and uh, investment in, uh, in driving engagement and thereby in the, uh, driving business, right? So we are a, um, we're heavy on our service, we're heavy on content, um, we're heavy on engagement through online channels, and, and so we need to validate in various ways that these are sound Hypothesis that, that, that these various engagements. So, how they do it as a business aspects of the business. That's right. So, what, um, so, you know, this is just part of uh, when data engineering becomes part of our, our basic competency, we, we, have, we can uh, start to engage in data driven decision making. And that's, that's essentially what we're, we try to, try to do. Um, also, on the streaming side, uh, mm -hmm. We have a very interesting application of sparse streaming. Um, there's an open source project uh, put out by uh, uh, not Zendesk, but the other guys. Is it Zendesk? Okay, so it's Zendesk. Okay, Zendesk uh, has is uh, maintaining an open source project called Maxwell, which uh, reads bin logs for MySQL and publishes JSON events to uh, Kafka. So it's a, uh, it's, a, it, it's a SQL parser, so it maintains its own internal representation of the schemas, which uh, makes it superior to other, um, uh, other previous uh, implementations. Uh, so we, we use Maxwell as a publisher to Kafka, which is a messaging service. And uh, we use Spark uh, streaming as a consumer. We use the direct streams API in order to, so we can guarantee exact ones processing. And so there we get a direct connection to the data layer for our various applications and uh, all sorts of possibilities over that, right? So we currently um, have successful implementations of data streaming of uh, data replication, so simple um, data replication, uh, and also uh, direct streaming metrics from the data layer, which has several advantages of not having to be implemented in the application. Okay, so I'm going to transition to um, show and tell. Um, so our scenario here has to do with our box manager email. And this is an email that customers get on their billing cycle, so generally it's monthly. Uh, it's a beautiful HTML email. Um, and it tells you when your box is coming, but more importantly, Look at all this real estate for upsets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so these, uh, I think, at least maybe six months ago, I'm not sure, but uh, at some point in the past, um, most of these emails uh, were dynamically rendered with these product tiles uh, ordered by determinist rules. So these were invented by um, our business intelligence a team working together with, with uh, uh, the uh, analysts. And, uh, they wanted to roll out, for example, samples for bookies at a certain point. 
And so that would be uh, you know, in priority in the, the box energy. Um, but we want to see if we can do better. It's a question. Platform, um, we do have an, an internal uh, message, uh, email rendering uh, service which uses man for <coughs> Um so, so here's the problem. Can we do better? Uh, can we order the product titles in Boxer's email to maximize profit? So this is specifically, can we target customers in a way to get a more effective ordering? Um, and the constraints are uh, every customer sees some order set of products. We don't see any downside to throwing that in the email. Um, and we do want to filter out at least the products that were already actually launched, which is a simple uh, step that can be done pre rendering of the email in a completely different part of the, the system. So um, uh, I want to lead with the good news, which is machine learning. Uh, and this pipeline in particular was able to produce a 25% revenue per uh, email open increase in that channel. So um, that was an early success that sort of told us we're heading in the right direction um, and that, that has uh, sort of validated some of our efforts. So our strategy um, for each product, uh, non raised product, we want to model the behavior on the website uh, that best distinguishes somebody who buys that product from somebody who buys other products. So it's a differentiation. Um, and we're going to produce a rank of the products by the strength of that indicative behavior. Um, so when it's present, we elevate those in the box of email. When it's absent, we default to a random order. Because it turns out the random is actually pretty good. Um, so, uh, and the model that we use is logistic regression, actually several logistic regression models, one per product, uh, because it learns this tipping point between success and failure, distinction, buying uh, behavior from buying something else. Uh, and in this case, the success value is buying product goods. Um, in broad sketch, we'll go into detail on each of these bullet points. Uh, so our design of the, the pipeline that's going to find this model and, and produce it, we're going to extract data from our data warehouse collections. We're going to join that data with hand curated metadata, uh, which we call knowledge base. Knowledge base. We're going to aggregate and pivot those events by customer and discretized time, so time buckets. We're going to generate a training set of feature vectors. And then we're going to uh, use data mining to select features to conclude the final model. Uh, finally, we're going to train and productionize the final model, which really is an afterthought because of uh, Apache Spark. Yeah. How big is this data? Like, say for creating models of this information, how many models do we have? We'll get to that in a little bit. Question? Yeah. Sorry to go back to the last uh, slide, but can you give an example of what behaviors that you saw that would help distinguish? Say customer type A, customer type B, et cetera. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a proof that it works, uh, but one of the things we saw across all of our products was when you visit the product page, right? So visiting the product page on our site for a particular product is a differentiator. Uh, and that's, uh, now, now that may seem obvious, right? But uh, the model is going to tell us how much weight to give that. Um, and it's also going to tell us what several dozen more features could also in, uh, impact this world. So the time spent on the page, does that nature of the guys inside what kind of customer class of product? Absolutely, yes, we, we can feed all that through and, and uh, we, we end up with, uh, I'll, I'll discuss the model a little bit further, we'll okay. go through all of those steps. Okay, so extraction, right? Our goal as always, in anything we do, is uh, to write modular, object-oriented, unit-tested code, right? And data science is no different, uh, at least as I want to start. Um, so this is, this is uh, uh, we're going to want to start, um, or we should be able to start building any data set uh, by performing a series of extractions. We should be able to compose them, 
Um, and you can leave the implementation details of the extractions to an extractor box. So we're going to encapsulate them. This is an example code. We're going to pass in. This is this is maybe a helper method that's implemented for a particular extraction uh, data pipeline, and it's going to um, pack in its context into a parameter string. It's going to pass in the parameters to the class, and the class is going to take it from there. Um, and each extractor class is going to dynamically generate a SQL, given the parameters passed in, uh, and then we're going to let Spark SQL and the data frames API do all the heavy lifting. Right? That's going to abstract away all of the, uh, the distributed data set. Um, so as a benefit of this design, uh, we encapsulate also the original data schema, uh, and we return denormalized records, which which be meaningful uh, for with lots of contexts. So um, because of that encapsulation, we can open up the independent development of several different data segments at the same time. So you work on this extractor class, I'll work on this extractor class. Um, we need a new version of this extractor class to swap them out. And it's, it's all modular and uh, uh, version control. Um, it also abstracts away metadata. So we don't have to know. Um, you know, offhand in our data pipeline, what the primary keys are, what is the time set column, right? Uh, sorts of general uh, features about the data set that will uh, be able to feed into transformations later. So, here's kind of an illustration of what we accomplished, right? So, we've got all of this data. Um, I guess this should be redshift instead of RDS. But let's say we've got a table in a uh, bunch of tables in our relational database. Um, we've got some email instances, which are um, you know many to one with email campaigns, um, and email instances are many to one with uh, uh, one to many with email opens and email clicks. So. And what we want to end up with is a very wide data set. Um, it's no longer locked inside of a, a data store. It's, in fact, uh, written out to a parquet file, which is a columnar data format, um, which allows lots of cool things like compression per column and, and uh, you know, predicate pushdown and all those fancy things. Um, it's also directly um, supported by the data frames API. So it's, it's got uh, purchased with Spark. Okay, so, so we've done our extra extraction. Now um, we apply domain knowledge. So we're stepping away from, tech, or from big data for a second. Why would we do that? Uh, well, uh, domain knowledge is critical. It's the way that experts organize and represent facts in their domain. Um, and uh, we need this knowledge to guide our feature extraction because without it, it's hard to um, prevent overfitting, which is a you know, constant problem in, in machine learning. Um, it's also vastly superior, in my opinion, at least, uh, to unsupervised feature extraction, such as uh, PCA, uh, or, or, or choose your, your favorite. Um, so, some problems with domain also, but if, you know, we, it's critical and so it's worth getting, and it's hard to get. Because domain knowledge can be costly to formalize, right? So we can't just uh, spend developer time building a program which is going to institute or formalize all of the knowledge in our in a particular domain, and then we'll just we'll just ask that program um, to to uh, spit our, our knowledge base. Um, so we actually need to go to the experts, and we need to go to the experts often. Um, so uh, what we do as a solution is we use Google Docs. And so here's an example of PageView knowledge base, and it's a spreadsheet in Google Docs. And as you can see, it was last edited by Dan Dillon in October, in August, sorry. Um, and what Dan has done, who is, who is our lead uh, um, on business intelligence here, uh, is he has taken a list of URLs, um, uh, and he has categorized them. He's uh, given them an action, 
And he's also identified the brands and products which are targeted on those pages. Um, and so we can go through several iterations on this script. Uh, you know, every time we've got a new set of URLs, which we're, we're often getting completely different sets of URLs uh, due to the, the, the diligent efforts of our, of our front end team, um, we run an update script, which automatically uh, takes in this file, appends new unclassified uh, rows to it, and then uploads it back to the two links, all automated. Then our domain expert does their thing. We can have another automated script which ingests the spreadsheet back into a reference table. So, uh, <coughs> question? Is the goal of the step basically to take data that would. I'm sorry, I still I haven't identified it yet. By the way, this head is shaped, it's dollar shaped over here. So the goal of this step, like, for abstract, like, for any problems you might have with original database that has 10,000, 100,000, a million unique distinct elements, just reducing it down to categories, so that if you were going to do one audit coding, now you don't have a million columns in your data frame, but like, that's basically the goal here. Well, so you're actually absolutely right. You touch upon, right, the curse of dimensionality, which are, um, domain knowledge is going to help us avoid, right? Uh, it's, going to, it's going to be our best weapon against these massive low-level data sets. Um, and yeah, it's going to tell us that all of these URLs are support URLs. Um, and we're going to be able to aggregate events for all of these hundreds of distinct URLs to a single category. I'm going to see if that's uh, significant. Can you do this for every Which it's, it's hard enough to set up this relationship with a domain expert, so <laughs> yeah. But the fact that Dan Dolan returns my texts is uh, is an important fact. So um, yeah, whatever you can set up. It, uh, in fact, um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to put this in the hands of our the business interests, right? If they've got a part of the business they want to optimize, okay. Let's build a knowledge base. Okay, and we'll take this knowledge base, we'll add it, we'll have a higher success, chance of success in our data mining, and, uh, and you'll own that, that part of the pipe. Um, any other questions? Okay, so um, next step is to aggregate Shark and Price Join and Pivot, which is a dance that's very hard to choreograph. Um, it's actually uh, surprisingly hard to accomplish this. Um, so we want to aggregate uh, to transform our records with timestamps into event counts and numerical values that are grouped by customer ID and discretized time buckets, right? for example, days. And then we're going to pivot that collection uh, to, uh, to collect the aggregated values into one extremely wide feature set per customer. Don't worry, this is automatic and somebody should be turning back. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, so the, the fact is pivoting is hard. Um, the, the, who knows who has, has ever used pivoting in say Excel? Something like that. It's one of your go-to tools in order to um, you know, roll up your data. Right, so that you can see on different dimensions what's going on. Um, well, it's hard because it, it makes a wide data set much wider. On our one of our most recent uh, uh, training sets, um, we end up with 8,736 columns uh, for 2.6 million rows. And that's not exactly big data, right? But if you want to turn it into human time, you know, I've, I've only got a couple days, right? Uh, then, then you're going to need a big data capabilities. Uh, and the surprise for us, at least in the beginning, was that the Data Frames API is not optimized for extremely wide data sets. Um, 
Now, we've you know, we made a lot of efforts, uh, even, even you know, support at Databricks is surprised to hear that we had such a hard time optimizing uh, Star SQL and Databricks uh, and, and data frames uh, for, for this purpose. But you know, there seems to be an you know, upper limit, um, perhaps due to overhead in structured data. Uh, so, um, so let's take a look at our, our innovation. Once again, modular, object-oriented, unit tests in Python code. Um, and so we we'll organize all our steps as a series of transformers, which encapsulate the aggregation, allowing for independent de uh, development, right? So just as we did, you took this, this extraction class, I'll take this extraction class, you take this extraction class and aggregate it, tell me what the meaningful aggregations are. Um, and we'll chain those together. Um, and we're going to, under the hood, uh, use Spark SQL and the data frames API, right? Um, to hit the overhead of the So when we aggregate, we get, we, uh, or, I'm sorry, now to accomplish, especially the pivot, right? Um, we're going to start by sharding. And um, sharding is taking the data set and chopping it up into independent sections. Uh, in this case, we are going to take, say, email events, and we're going to divide it up into separate tables or separate parquet uh, formats uh, according to customer ID. So we're going to take different ranges of our customer IDs, or we're going to take to do model or arithmetic or something like that. And uh, we're going to divide our shards by customer ID. We're also going to compress the data. Um, so we're going to extremely wide data set, and that often means an extremely sparse data set. <coughs> And so the uh, format that we use is a compressed sparse vector. And it's very simple, human readable. Um, so if you take something like this with 18 uh, mostly zeros and uh, you compress it down to a triple, right? Uh, and uh, the first element is the uh, size, the dimensionality of your set, and then be a list of indices followed by a list of values. Uh, that happens to be um, the text format for the sparse vector uh, it, it, that's part of uh, the MLib, uh, MLib library in Spark. Um, so after much trying with data frames API, um, we abandoned those efforts and went uh, to the lower level RDD API. Uh, and in particular, the key value methods, which were very, very useful. Um, so here we're using the combined by key, which is a low level, basically map use, right? Um, and uh, that, uh, then we can pass back into our pipeline as a data frame, um, but uh, is, the heavy lifting is being optimized using the, the low level API. Okay, so uh, we accomplish, um, with the, the join and then the pivot, what we, what we accomplish is we take our, uh, our emails, our features, uh, or I'm sorry, our, our events, right, and our, our knowledge base, and we convert it into a very wide set of features per time bucket, per customer. Okay? So we might get um, total sends in the first month. We might get, referring to our knowledge base, Total Carvers, which is one of our brands, opens in one zero, and so on. Okay, so uh, okay, so that's the end of that section. I'm sorry, I didn't put a good break there. Um, but the next step in our implementation is is to feature that. So we've, we've done the hard work of uh, turning our data into a, a feature set for customers. We're now going to um, uh, featureize, turn it into a standardized set of, of, feature, of uh, feature vectors. Um, and we're first going to do that by taking our customer history and exploding it into several windows of time. So our um, predictive tasks have a, very, a, a time interpretation, obvious time interpretation, given a certain amount of historical information, uh, tell me what's going to happen next. That's, uh, that's a lot of what we want to know. So um, we can treat customer history as actually a not so independent, but, but throw almost in the mix, set of time windows 
for what happened in two months, and then what happened next? What happened in three days, and then what happened next? Right? What happened in a month and the last three days, and what happened a week later? Right? Um, so, uh, and then we're going to define one or more prediction targets. Right? What's the value that we want to predict? Is it a class? A classification? Is it a, just a, a regression value? Um, we're going to standardize each dimension so that it has a, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, so that uh, avoids problems of scale, right? Dominating linear models. Um, and we're going to persist that all as text files and compress less compressed large vectors, and that is our base feature set. Um, some care of speed there. Uh, but uh, so now, uh, the set of problems that uh, we uh, mentioned before under the title cursive dimensionality, um, uh, the, this problem arises when the data set is wide, um, which is often also sparse. And this in turn makes the numerical methods of various machine learning algorithms less effective. Right? So um, unfortunately, Sparks and the uh, NLA library doesn't seem to have an opinion about how to approach the cursor dimensionality or do feature selection. Uh, but that's okay, it's a hard problem. Uh, so, so rather than resort to hand selecting features, uh, we rolled our own data mining process. Uh, and it goes a little something like this. Um, so, first, we randomly select a set of new features to test from our 8,700 or so uh, features. Um, we derive a training set from a base set for those features plus whatever previously selected features or, or our favorite features that happen to be on the line. Um, we train a model, in this case, the logistic regression model. We calculate the p-value for each feature. And this isn't built into any of the spark um, and took a lot of doing, it was well worth doing. Um, and if you consider uh, in making this part of your, your you know, machine learning pipeline, I absolutely recommend uh, taking a look at the uh, test works. Go back to the references, don't go to the blog post. There's a lot of actually inaccurate information out there. So two uh, sources that I can highly recommend is Elements of Statistical Learning by Trevor ACL, right, which uh, has a very good treatment of logistic, um, I'm sorry, uh, linear regression models, among other things. Uh, and we also picked up Applied Logistic Regression, um, which helped us over a hump in that case. So um, definitely go to the source of building literature and find the right way to, to implement this. Um, so once we have a p-value, which gives us the probability, right, that uh, the value is, that the, the hypothesis is True. If the null hypothesis is true, right? There we go. Okay. <laughs> so let's say the p-value gives us the probability that the null hypothesis is true, and we want a very low p-value. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's my test will be you. So uh, and so we retain the significant features with a significant with a, a, a threshold of, of uh, p-value, uh, and we repeat. We go back. We stochastically grab another set. We Throw it in with the features that work. Now, um, this isn't just a monotonically increasing process here, right? That the we track uh, we track the performance and key values of the models as on each iteration. We track you know performance metrics like area of the ROC curve, uh, and we generally do see a trend towards the, the the maximal performance, right? But we see features drop out. We see performance drip, uh, dip. We see performance stall and then jump. So we get a lot of interesting feedback about our data set. Um, we can go back and look and say, okay, what is not a stable uh, member of our significant feature set? What's being screened off, say, by other features? Um, what, when did we make a discovery that, that is responsible for a <coughs> jump in our performance, right? Um, so that's all interesting. Okay, and finally, last slide. 
uh, I have a feeling that there may be questions here, but um, we production productionize the model, right? Um, so tune, tuning the parameters is made really easy in the Spark ML library. Um, you, it's really easy. You've already done it thousands of times. You just train one more model. Uh, and then because of your reusable models, modules, um, which are all unit tested, therefore ready for production, um, you can simply reconfigure your production pipeline and apply your model to uh, your, your, your customer's data as it comes in. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, thank you, thank you guys. Um, this is my contact information. If you're interested in joining the scholarship up here is a link to the job by page. Uh, and uh, here's a list of the positions that we happily had before. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, it does not compete. <laughs> no, it's, it's a hard question, right? Um, a dollar shape. Okay. Um, well, we, it doesn't really. Um, Dan Doan, for example, is a guiding member of our data science squad. Uh, and he plays a crucial part in, in uh, prioritizing projects and evaluating the timeline. Um, so uh, I think it's, it's me. Uh, I prefer not to try. Make a decision. Why are there two teams? Uh, well, uh, it serves me. I don't, know. <laughs> uh, I don't make those decisions. Do you use Apache Airflow or if not, what do you use to schedule a job with Canvas? So, uh, Airflow, no, we have, we have looked at Airflow, um, but actually, Databricks is made really easy um, to. Uh, have modular notebooks that can also be now with their, their, sort of their newest features um, uh, can also be called in a with full command flow control. So you can actually build master uh, notebooks which which uh, have a, a full uh, control flow for other uh, other notebooks. Um, we haven't yet. Found a need apart from the, the job the job scheduling features of Databricks, and uh, we certainly haven't exhausted the, the new notebook uh, features that they've introduced. With those notebooks that are associated with schedules, um, do you check them in the sources of code you get and treat them as code? So one um, one thing that does need work and returning is the development cycle. Uh, with, uh, we really do prefer to treat it like any other development project, any other engineering project, the way version control we do have a Git repository for it, uh, which we treat as the source of truth. Um, Dimbers also has their own built in version control, which competes as a source of truth, so that needs a little tweaking. Um, and uh, there, it, we've, we've talked to them specifically about improving that trend. Um, you know, continuous delivery, continuous integration, whatever that means, it, it often means um, being able to divide uh, to, to branch your environment uh, and do developments to merge it in to deploy. You mentioned that you have um, chose some features and, and trained on those, and then you kept set the, the had the best results, and you threw some other features in, and you said your performance with that goes down. It seems kind of strange. That it would, how does that happen? Because it seems like if you add these things, if you just make them insignificant, you're going to be back where you were at least. So how can you go down? So, so the question is, um, as we're doing our data mining, we're stochastically we're stochastic grabbing and adding features. How is it that it can possibly dip? And the answer is, it, it doesn't dip much. It fluctuates. Um, is it just in the randomness of the test or something? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think it probably that, that that question could be answered 
and the right one either. Are you saying the training? Yeah, it could be that it's the uh, uh, stochasticity of the gradient descent. Maybe it's um, the fact that uh, there is. So, so um, my understanding is that linear models are sensitive to context. The other, the other features that are included uh, can affect the performance of linear features. So <coughs> perhaps we throw in some noise, which is uh, partially correlated with some of our best performing features. And this cause this frustrates the model, and uh, or that the the algorithm and causes it to perform uh, worse. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Great presentation, Greg. Um, you talked about um, logistic regression. So I was wondering, besides logistic regression, do you guys consider any other model to see like to get the performance? Like we know, you know, using that on a um, We have we have stuck with linear models, logistic regression in particular, uh, because of their it's a straightforward interpretation, um, which we like a lot. But we have also um, compared them to uh, you know, other implementations, especially in Spark, right? Uh, like uh, decision trees, and um, uh, uh, we found we actually. Early on, we were fairly disappointed with the performance of decision trees. Um, I, I know there's lots of literature out there saying that, that decision trees are a, a broad based solution for lots of these problems, but uh, they didn't seem to perform very well. Uh, I think you were next. Um, do you have a model that you have to do and also um, do you use other uh, metrics besides the p value to uh, decide, decide on which features to uh, do? So I, uh, the question is, do we ever deal with duplicate uh, yeah. data and do we use other measure, measures other than p value to, to uh, for kind of data? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by duplicate in this case. Um, the features that have the same kind of problem. So, but, so there are eight functional relationships. So, so this is these are features that are maybe proxies for each other. That sort of thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. There, there are problems with that. We haven't um, we haven't actually found the need to weed those out very aggressively. Um, but uh, you know, if, if we were trying to squeeze the last drop, which we are eventually, right, on, on several iterations, we may get down to, to the point of, of uh, trying to really uh, to find a better um, means of, of data mining. Uh, and we've tried, um, in addition to the p value, uh, unsuccessfully, we've, we've tried, um, you know, just very dumb because we've got a standardized scale, right? So just trying fixed thresholds to actually perform very poorly. Uh, they, I mean, they do they do a little something, but you know, throwing away everything that's every weight that's uh, too small, it doesn't doesn't really do the trick. Um, but uh, we find key value is, is actually is is a superb way to, to see all the right like, characteristics and everything. Yes. You mentioned about the hand tooling and the trace, so for the labeling of the data, like the training data set. Uh, well, no, I mean, go directly to our internal uh, interests, our business interests, right? So, um, uh, ideally, it's somebody in product or uh, analytics or whoever's interested in that domain. So, John, you described that you have a by populating your time, just realizing it, and sort of mapping that out into more models, which means, I guess, that in your linear modeling, you don't have any directly expressed relationship between consecutive time bundles. Correct. So, have you taken any approaches to try to look at specifically funnel modeling somehow, you know, taking into account the consecutive time bundles and consecutive actions? Uh, yeah, it's it's. I kind of like um, 
my inclination is actually to uh, try to uh, introduce interaction terms before you know, fully coupling the history, right? So interaction terms between times at any point, right, uh, can, can be very flexible. Um, it, and, and after that, I might actually go to a knowledge base. So I might ask our, our uh, digital product people, what is a significant sequence of events? What is a meaningful sequence of events? You want to know if they went here, here, and here, um, you know, in some time frame, because you know that's you know, that's leveling up in the in the funnel. Then I, I, I think I go to that first before uh, trying to make time a first class feature. Yes. So you mentioned that a lot of companies, it's difficult for them to invest in data science teams because the uh, so the, the ROI is obscure. How were you able to get an investment deal? <laughs> uh, burning the midnight oil. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I think if you want to be doing this work at, in, in this sort of environment, it is it can be incumbent on you to bring, to bring the capabilities. Um, I don't want to sell you guys all out. <laughs> Hopefully your bosses are Data science, DI, data warehousing team, and, and what do you think would be a good size? Well, uh, so we've got a team of about two and a half right now uh, data engineers. Um, and we've got uh, actually a multitude of embedded analysts on the business side. And, uh, but uh, we were also hiring. And obviously, to um, the analytics engineer, which sort of bridges those two uh, uh, roles. Um, and we are uh, also, the, and then data engineers, um, specifically in that specialization, would be pulled from the pool of uh, back end engineers. Yeah. Are back end engineers in here? It should be. But it's not. Okay, but yeah, we're also hiring back end engineers. That's that should be at the top. Um, uh, so yeah, if you need back end engineers who want to uh, you know liven up their work with some data, uh, we would really want to it. So it sounds like you're saying two and a half people is not really enough to do with you. Not nearly, no. <laughs> but it's it's you know, once again you suffer for your own success, right? Um, the responsibilities, uh, you know, you, you will basically be, uh, you know, taking responsibilities until you fail. <laughs> but uh, no, it's it's uh, uh, yeah. I think there's you, basically it's it's the same. You scale up horizontally. Um, the number of projects that you have uh, times the resources they require, right? Okay. One more. Yes. Uh, well, like I said, uh, I kind of alluded to before, um, Spark became a kind of personal passion of mine before it became a formal part of, of Dark Shape Club. Um, I, I guess, so it is a little bit of happenstance, um, but it's been actually validated time and time again by market leaders, by issue leaders, um, as, as the cutting edge platform to be working with. Okay. okay. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. So, uh, I'm going to post the slides in the new uh, website in a couple of days. On that just slides. Um, just quick thing over here. You guys have to notice this. We innovate LA 2016. Uh, basically, uh, the LA Economic Development Corporation is hosting a bunch of technology events uh, this month, October 6th. You see me smiling a lot, so you probably don't want to. Yeah, okay, that's good. 
So uh, there's a bunch of events. You can probably check out the website. Yeah, I have a bunch of events going on this month. Uh, feel free to attend them. It's a uh, you know, pretty good thing to do uh, by the LA County. So promoting LA uh, businesses and uh, technology in the LA County. Uh, one last thing I want to mention. Uh, Brad and Jason, they're giving uh, free haircuts and free uh, shirts. <laughs> just go and sit down and do all of this. Uh, last thing, uh, the LA Big Data user group just crossed 2,500 members. You know, it's a great Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.